Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining me today uh, for this webinar. Today we're going to be talking about conjugate heat transfer best practices uh, using the SimScale platform. Uh, before we get started, just a little background about myself. Uh, my name is Matt Bemis. I'm an application engineer here at SimScale. I'm based in the Boston office. Um, I've been working at SimScale just about a year now and uh, before that I had a few other CFD um, jobs before that. So been running CFD simulations on a daily basis for about four years now and um, love helping people solve, solve their CFD issues. Um, so just a little background about SimScale. Uh, we were founded in 2012 um, in Munich. So the founders were all um, uh, TU Munich grads and um, have been working since then to develop a completely cloud-based, uh, web-based um, CFD and FEA platform. Um, by now we have offices in Boston and in New York City uh, and we're up around 80 employees and we cover uh, almost all the time zones. So we do have a community license so we have um, a lot of people using that and engaging um, on a daily basis. So we've had 150,000 people sign up and we have more than uh, 300,000 simulation projects. So uh, just a little bit about SimScale and, and what we do. So we're completely browser-based, uh, cloud-based, um, fluid dynamics, solid mechanics, and thermodynamics platform. Um, so maybe you've used a traditional um, simulation platform, um, maybe in school or, or in professional field. The chances are those were desktop solutions. And here, all you have to do is go to simscale.com, log in, upload your CAD, and then start you know, setting up um, boundary conditions and so on right within your browser. Um, you can access all your projects um, just as long as you have a, um, a computer, a, a web browser and an internet connection, um, you, can, you can simulate. Cool, so first I'm just going to kind of do a high level overview of uh, the, the workflow we're doing today. So anytime you do a, um, a simulation whether that's conjugate heat transfer or a different type of CFD solution um, or maybe even FEA, really you're, you're uploading your CAD so you have to have your geometry defined. That does have to be done ahead of time in a, in a CAD program, maybe like Onshape or something like that. Um, then you set up your, your simulation. So boundary conditions, material assignments, uh, solver settings, that's where you define the physics. Uh, lastly, you, you hit run and your simulation will run, and then you'll start to understand, you know, post-process and, and look at the results. So today's application is going to be conjugate heat transfer. Um, just how to set up, you know, it's really best practices. So if you're using the SimScale platform, um, what is, uh, you know, what guidelines to follow um, to guarantee success, how to make sure your results are good, how to make sure your solution is converged, and so on. All right, so what is, uh, what is conjugate heat transfer? So that is uh, heat transfer between uh, solid and fluids. Um, so this can uh, account for there's going to be conduction heat transfer through any of your solids and then convection um, uh, within your fluid. Now we can take into account both forced and natural convection. So um, today's application will be electronics, maybe natural convection just you know, passively cooled, um, or maybe a, a different application like today where you have a fan uh, cooling your, your electronics. Um, now, conjugate heat transfer is, of course, very common um, in electronics cooling, but it's uh, also used for things like heat exchangers, industrial machinery, and, you know, ovens, all, a slew of other applications. Awesome. So just taking a look at the simulation setup, uh, you know, how do you set up a... a a CHD simulation in some scale, what are the steps? So it always starts with the CAD. Um, that top image there is basically a, a manufacturer ready board um, with every little last bit of detail. And then the bottom one, I, I did put a, it's a bit transparent, but it's basically what I brought into the platform. So I did do some CAD cleanup and all. Um, the electronic segment is usually, usually ends up with incredibly intricate CAD super, super complicated, you have um, things that just aren't important to simulation. So you're going to have uh, serial numbers on chips, um, you're going to have all the pins, you know, screws, nuts, bolts, all, things like that. Now here we see a ton of pin connectors, which is pretty common for, for wiring harnesses. 
Um, what I end up doing is filling those in as, as solid blocks. Things like that, they, they really don't have a lot of conjugate heat transfer going on in them. There's, of course, no heat load on them, but they do obstruct flow. So I usually end up just approximating them as blocks. Um, I also got rid of some very, very small bodies, which are not emitting heat. So um, if we just see, if you use, see my cursor in this area, we have some extremely small chips. Um, you know, if it's, it's good to kind of take a high level look and understand where's the bulk of my heat um, being generated and, and, you know, preserve that stuff, but, but not the other things. Um, now you will notice, so I, I put a housing on it. I got this model on GrabCAD actually, and uh, it didn't have a, a chassis. So I added a, a chassis, a housing, and I actually added a bit of an inlet and outlet extension. That's just to help with convergence. All right, so you're usually, if you're using a desktop um, CAD program, you're going to uh, save out a file and then import it by dragging, dragging and dropping into our platform. Um, we do have a CAD connection for Onshape, which is what our team uses internally. So I can actually just click that and there's no need to download a, a local file. Just click that and, and you can sign into Onshape and you'll be able to see your files. Step two in the process is some geometry operations. So the first thing you're going to have to do is extract your fluid volume. Now, on the right side of the tree in Zim scale, there will be um, uh, basically all your CAD bodies. And it is critical, you always need a CAD body that represents the fluid volume. Uh, very new CFD users will, kind of the classic case will be they, you know, they'll have their electronics or they'll have a pipe, but they're assigning boundary conditions to solids. They don't have the fluid on the inside. So it's important to extract that flow volume. We do allow some geometry oper operations on the platform. This is just trying to be uh, user friendly and, and um, everyone has to extract a, vol a flow volume. So why not support this type of functionality? So just hover over your geometry, say, add operation. And then this is going to be an open inner region. What this means is it's not watertight. So if, if I had my um, inlet and outlet extension, if those were capped, or if I had a long pipe that was capped and it was completely watertight, uh, it would be a closed inner region. Here, it's an open inner region. All we're going to do is basically select the boundary faces. So that inlet face, um, here I'll, I'll point it out right here, and the outlet face, and then a seed face. A seed face is just a face that um, the fluid volume touches, so somewhere um, on the inside of that electronics assembly. And, and next, we're going to imprint. Now, it's absolutely critical you always want to imprint your geometry um, when doing a conjugate heat transfer analysis. What this does is uh, multiple bodies which are touching, it splits the surfaces there and, and basically generates more surfaces. Um, this is critical for um, correct conjugate heat transfer and, and, um, and basically cons conservation of energy. So the best way to just sort of explain what uh, an imprint does is to just um, show you a before and after. So here I've actually hidden, uh, these are capacitors with like small plastic bases. Um, and here I've hidden um, this small plastic base. I've then selected the PCB board face. And we'll see that even though there's a, uh, a body that I, I had, a, it's, I'm going to end up assigning it ABS plastic. Um, it's all a continuous face there. When we split it, there's actually going to be a separate face there. Cool. So looking here, this is after the imprint operation we now have a separate face there. The next step is going to be material assignments. Um, and I'm going to start basically uh, go from the outside of the model in. So I'm going to assign the chassis as aluminum. And I'm just going to assign the same thing for those inlet um, and outlet extensions. Now, we have a default material database. So I just use default aluminum, which, as you folks probably know, is a very high uh, thermal conductor. Next is going to be ABS plastic. Basically, all um, connectors, you know, plastic connectors are some kind of uh, ABS or something like that. So I grabbed um, those bodies and assigned ABS. Now, you will notice um, one kind of small trick that, that isn't a bad idea is, um, you know, at this, this top right corner, uh, I have a continuous body here, right, a single body. That's because there was maybe just, say, six or so connectors there. It is, you know, it just saves mesh to, to make it a continuous body. You don't have a fluid volume kind of uh, uh, going around all these small little connectors. And um, 
there's really going to be very little conduction heat transfer through these parts. So they're not high conductors and there's no heat loads here. Um, really, they're just going to obstruct the flow. The next assignment is going to be copper. And um, here just I assigned all the heat sinks as copper. Um, as, as you probably know, copper is a incredibly high uh, con thermal conductor. It's a pretty typical choice for um, heat sinks. Cool. So for all the capacitors and um, the chips, which they're actually um, underneath those heat sinks, the heat sinks are sort of oversized and that their surface area at the base is not the same as the um, chip, but that's okay. Um, I'm applying silicon to, to all these parts. Um, and again, these are all default materials which are in our, our um, database. We do support you changing um, material properties and saving. So if you want to change thermal conductivity or something like that, um, you certainly have the ability to. Now the, the last assignment I'm doing, um, or one of the last assignments at least, um, is going to be uh, PCB. So uh, a printed circuit board is usually layers of uh, plastic and uh, with um, copper layers in between. So this is kind of unique in that it's not a single type of material, but we treat it as a, we give it bulk properties. Um, so this, there's actually, an, um, PCB actually has anisotropic thermal conductivity properties. So it is very important to take this into account and accurately um, uh, calculate this. So the in-plane um, thermal conductivity is very high. It's usually a lot of times around uh, 20 or more uh, watts per meter K, but the through plane is only is usually less than one. It's usually right around 0.3. Um, this is because those copper layers um, are have extremely high conductivity um, values, um, yet the uh, the plastic layers are almost like insulators. Um, now, there it's pretty easy to calculate the bulk thermal conduct conductivity here. Um, the through plane is basically, you can think of it as like um, um, Ohm's law with just uh, resistors in series versus the in plane is resistors in parallel. Next, we're going to set boundary conditions. So boundary conditions are basically setting your inlets, outlets, or, you know, what is your flow doing? So at the inlet, I'm going to have a velocity of two meters per second with about 19 Celsius, which is as an ambient temperature. Um, the outlet is just going to be zero pressure gauge. And um, the thing to note here, if, you know, if you're a bit new to, to CFD, is really what we're doing on the outlet is we're letting the solver calculate the um, velocity profile and the temperature. And we're doing the exact opposite at the inlet. So we're defining the, really it's mass flow rate and then temperature. And then we're saying, okay, calculate the, the pressure. Um, lastly, we're also boundary conditions are also where you set your heat loads for all the chips. Now, um, I know there's a lot of assignments here, but I basically have five watts to all the chips which are underneath heat sinks. Um, and then the capacitors are at one watt. Um, one thing to note is that our um, volume, uh, our heat load assignments to volumes are actually under advanced concepts in the tree, and they're called a power source. So sometimes people, um, they're, they're a little hidden, but, but that's where to find them. I'll jump into the product in a minute, and we can take a look as well where, where to find them. Okay, so we're almost completely ready and, um, you know, uh, ready to hit go and run the simulation. Um, one thing that I, that's very important to do in order to judge convergence, especially with conjugate heat transfer simulations, is set up some result control um, items. So what I'm going to do here is um, basically uh, select the inlet and outlet face and some other faces of interest. And uh, while the solve is actually running, I'm going to have it write out uh, field variables. So on the inlet, I'm going to select that face. I'm going to say, okay, um, we're defining uh, temperature and velocity, but tell me pressure. Um, every single iteration, and then we can kind of view that and plot it over time and understand if the solution is converged or not. Um, a solution is considered converged when, as you're adding more iterations, you still get the same answer. Um, and beyond just looking at a standard convergence plot with residuals, it, it's hard to kind of put, a, um, um, put any physical sense behind that. Here, what you can do is, okay, my outlet, um, my outward face is no longer fluctuating in temperature. You know, that means we must have energy balance here, basically, um, or at least it stopped changing. I also probe the uh, 
chip faces, especially the warmest chips or chips of interest, and say, okay, I want to make sure that the temperature here um, flatlines is not changing as I add more iterations. So here I actually I grabbed um, uh, result controls for, for three chips, and I grabbed the three um, closest to the outlet because they're going to be seeing the warmest air. So I'm just kind of sort of uh, common sense um, assume really that uh, the these three chips are going to be the warmest in the domain. The first ones uh, coming into the model, they get the cold air, so they, they shouldn't be a problem. All right, so at this point, I'm actually going to kick out of uh, the slide deck and um, and jump into the product. Now, my goal here is to just sort of go over um, how to set up the simulation a little bit. Um, I have a reference project here that we're going to take a look at and just kind of show you some of the steps for um, flow volume extraction and all that. So geometry operation to do a, um, a flow volume extraction, um, you have to pick the boundary faces. So here that's the outlet face. Um, I'm going to zoom in and grab that inlet face. And then the seed face is just any face on the inside. Um, and then this keep existing parts, you actually have to toggle on because we need all the solids to be preserved. So I'll go ahead and hit start here. That actually takes about a minute to run. So I did do it ahead of time. Uh, we can just go up here and take a look at this geometry. Cool. So now if, if you look in the tree, if you go to the bottom, uh, there's this flow region. That's what we extracted. I, you see I already imprinted here, so we're ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and say create simulation. Now it defaults to conjugate heat transfer because I have multiple bodies here. There's a quick um, description, okay, heat transfer between fluids and solids, that sounds like us. One great thing I really like that's new is this help me choose. So if you're not sure, there's a lot of options here if you're new. Let's just go ahead and say help me choose, I'm interested in flow, there's going to be heat transfer, there's going to be fluids and solids. I did that kind of fast, but what's going on here is we're graying out other options and, and sort of funneling down the way you're trying to solve. Here we have conjugate heat transfer, so awesome. Let's go ahead and say create simulation. And I'm going to go ahead and name this, um, we'll call this webinar demo. Great. One of the next things to, to note here is basically going, you're going to work um, from the top here all the way down, assigning materials and, and things like that. A green checkbox means um, you're all set. A red circle means it needs to be addressed before you can hit run. Uh, now, geometry's already been selected. The context you saw when I created the simulation, it was, it was sort of thinking. So what's going on there is automatic contact detection is occurring. Um, and um, it basically um, is grabbing all the interfaces between two volumes or two CAD bodies and considering them thermally coupled. Um, now, if you ever have uh, geometry and there aren't, um, uh, if there's basically failed interfaces or partial interfaces, this is a big red flag. Um, first thing to check is make sure you imprinted your geometry. Usually that's the problem. If you imprint your geometry and they're still failed or partial um, interfaces, it's a CAD problem. So right there, go back into CAD. Um, otherwise, you're, you're kind of fighting an uphill battle. Next, under model, I'm going to go ahead and set the uh, gravity vector. You'll notice the Cartesian coordinate system in the lower right corner. Um, and so here I'm going with minus um, z. So we'll go ahead and just start assigning some materials here. Um, I'll grab air. And I'm going to end up grabbing aluminum for the uh, for a couple of the solids here. All right, so inlet, outlet extension, um, and the, the chassis. So I'm just going to hide the things I've already assigned so far and sort of keep on working. Um, next, we'll do ABS plastic um, for the uh, pins and, and connectors and things like that. So I'm going to just uh, left click to pick. And um, I am going to select the base of the capacitors as well.
And there's a couple capacitors in the back corner here. Uh, and I forgot one last one. So right there, awesome. 18 volumes, we're in good shape. I'll go ahead and hit save. Um, next, I'm going to assign the copper heat sinks. Cool. Now, um, the PCB board, I'm just going to start with ABS, select the PCB, call it PCB, and then for transport, it's going to be anisotropic. And for thermal conductivities, we know that the Z is going to be the through plane, so we'll say about 0.3. The X and Y, I'll just use 21. Um, now, the density usually ends up being around 1850 uh, kilograms per cubic meter. So we're all good there. And then at this point, we're just going to assign the silicon. So I'm going to grab um, all the capacitors. And, and then all the chips under the heat sinks. Like I mentioned, they're a little hard to see because these heat sinks are pretty large. Um, but I'll grab them. Great. So now I'm done with material assignments. I'm going to go ahead and show all. Next, we're going to do boundary conditions. Let's do the velocity inlet at that inlet. This is going to be my, uh, minus 2 meters per second. It is important to note that I have to add a negative there because I'm going against the positive x um, with the global Cartesian coordinate system. I'll rename this inlet. The default um, temperature is, is fine. I'll use a pressure outlet boundary condition at the outlet. I'm just going to name this outlet. Um, cool. There are already a lot of small uh, um, heat load assignments, so I'm, I'm going to skip that for now. But basically, down under advanced concepts for power sources, you're, you're going to use an absolute power source. I'll just select one, and I'm just going to call this 5 watts and we'll add the 5 watt there. Um, what's more important really here, um, going down to um, simulation control, the start time and end time, this is a steady state simulation, so we're really just saying here 1,000 iterations. The right interval, let's just save the last set of results. It's steady state, we only care about the converged solution, so 1,000 is good. Usually for conjugate heat transfer, I kick this up a little bit, this will just cancel the simulation um, if you hit that point. Now under result control, this is where I'm going to probe and, and make sure my solution is converged. Um, grabbing the inlet face isn't that interesting, so I usually grab the outlet face. What I'm going to look for here is uh, temperature um, stops changing. Now the right control, I usually bump this up to every 10. Um, it, it is a, you know, an I.O. Um, function. so. It's, it's going to slow down the solve a little bit. So I'm going to do it every 10. They'll still tell me the same story in terms of convergence. Um, and then I actually grab the, the top face of the chip between the heat sink usually as well. So I'll just do one demo here. Um, go ahead. Grab that top face. And what is it? We see it's face um, 1,100 on chip 10. So I'll just call this chip 10. Same thing here, write out every 10 iterations. Um, and I think that's that. Great. Cool, so I of course ran this ahead of time. Let's go look at a solution. Um, let's run. So I ran this, okay, five watt chips. It took uh, 
just over an hour. Um, I ran this a couple of weeks back. And if we look at the convergence plot, things look pretty good. Um, basically, these are X, Y, and Z velocity, pressure, and then enthalpy. Um, and these are re residuals. So for f the 5 watt chips, I actually forgot the result controls. Let's just take a look at another simulation here. I did the area averages. Um, and then if we look at the outlet, and let's look at temperature. Okay, this is good news. So um, we really get the initial condition originally, and then temperature rises over time on the fluid domain, and then it completely flat lines. So on the x-axis, as we add more iterations, the solution isn't changing at all. At the outlet, we're getting 317 Kelvin. On the chip side of things, uh, it should be the same story here. Yep, exactly. So I grabbed uh, those three warmest chips here. Okay, this chip is at about um, you know, 328, so that's about 58, 55 degrees Celsius. Um, at this point, we can jump to the solution field and, and take a look at some results, and then we'll jump back to the slide deck. So I'd already done some post-processing on this. Um, that was just loading like the, the state zero, so you kind of saw the initial conditions, which is why everything was blue. Here we have um, at the thousandth iteration. Um, so here we just have some particle traces um, showing temperature. You only see one axis here because I'm mapping a temperature to this whole domain. What is kind of interesting here is, um, so I put one watt heat loads on the capacitors and then five on all the chips. Um, the capacitors are, are the hottest in the domain by far. And it's because they just don't have those heat sinks. They don't have um, uh, the surface area there. So this is the type of result you can get out of uh, the post-processor. We can also animate um, you know, the, the results and things like that as well. Um, at this point, I'll just jump back to the slide deck. All right, so just taking a look at some of the results here. Um, here I have an animation um, so showing some, some comet particle traces. Um, basically, it, this is as if we're animating it as if we're following a single particle from the inlet through the entire domain. Um, and we're only mapping temperature here. Actually, I, this must be velocity because, um, yeah, so the, the particle trace is velocity. Um, the domain is mapped as temperature. Um, it's all the solids. Um, a, a few things, right? So the dominant flow uh, comes straight in, goes across those um, heat sinks, which is all good. That makes perfect sense. Then the flow hits the back and, and starts to go to the left. Now, because of that, we have uh, some interesting flow characteristics going on. There is a um, sort of a, a clockwise swirl in that top top corner there where you actually have flow coming back towards the inlet, which is pretty wild. This means um, you know, the heat sink in the corner or those capacitors um, will have a tendency to get warm. So you should certainly monitor. I would probably put probe points or, or grab a surface um, probe and, and look at temperature over there. Um, next, the first thing I noticed, again, this isn't my model, and I, I put the inlets and outlets at an almost arbitrary position, but those heat sinks over there actually um, are, are perpendicular to the dominant flow direction, right? So the flow comes into the back, um, hits the back, t turns left, and then it's going uh, perpendicular to those fins. So I'm sure if you were to look at heat flux on those heat sink fins, they're, they're doing a terrible job um, actually transferring heat. And lastly, even worse, um, they're completely blocking the flow for, for that capacitor right there. So all my capacitors had the same um, uh, heat, uh, heat load on them, but that's the hottest one, and it's because it's tucked right behind a, um, a flow obstruction. And lastly, um, as the flow kind of goes in, and then it, it's kind of in a counterclockwise rotation, so you when you see that in, in a, in a chassis, you always want to um, take a look at what's going on in the center, because usually it's there's a vortex and then you have a dead zone in the center. Here I'm just mapping temperature, um, and uh, again, yeah, capacitors are the warmest part of the model. So if I were to do things differently, uh, one design change would be interested in is, okay, rotate the, the um, heat sinks. Does that have a material impact on the chip temperature? Does it have a material impact on the capacitor? Even just moving this capacitor, you know, out of uh, that flow obstruction, it's blocked on two sides, which is not good. We do see in the back corner those capacitors are warm, um, and um, I'm surprised they're not warmer. But it is good to see that, um, you know, 
they're they're getting some flow there. Again, just outlining the problem over here. I already chatted about. Here's a top view. So we're looking at velocity and. Um, I modified the range a little bit, which is why, um, so I, I made the max one meter per second. We know the inlet's at that two meters per second of, of the boundary condition. And I'm also mapping uh, vectors here. So um, to me, it was sort of interesting to see um, the flow starts to kind of break off and, and head towards the outlet at almost like a 45 degree angle uh, quite quickly. I figured it would um, and sort of bang into the back and then make it a sharper turn. Um, one thing I'm doing here is I'm scaling the vector length based on magnitude. So over in the blue sections where you have almost no flow, um, the vectors are so short you can't even really see them. Um, now this cut plane does go through the heat sink, so you do see good flow in the channels, which is really important. Um, one thing when you're meshing the model is to really pay attention. Make sure you have uh, you know, a good amount of cells or, or nodes in between um, your, your ch heat sink fins. Um, now we noticed, okay, so when, the, when we were looking at the animations of the comets, really we had flow hit the back and then kind of go up and actually head towards the inlet. You, you do see that here. So um, you see vectors, they're small, but they're there and they head towards here and then they, they bang into this corner and, and head back towards the inlet. Um, so there is some recirculation in the, in the clockwise direction here. And um, Really, the, the only swirl you see is sort of right here. Um, so it's kind of small. And right where that chip is, there, there's a bit of a dead zone. But it's not quite as bad as what I thought it would be. Here I'm just showing particle traces. Um, and I'm mapping temperature from the inlet. It's clear to see um, the, uh, the particle trace cylinders are actually mapped to temperature here because they're, they're very blue right on that inlet. Awesome. Um, that's an overview of what I have to share today. Um, when this is posted, you'll be able to get a link to the project. So you can take a look, rip it apart, and, and uh, you know, run more simulations, do a design change if you're interested. At this point, I'm ready for a, a Q&A. So um, inside, there, there should be an option to uh, ask questions, and um, as you uh, type into the dialog box and ask questions. I'll be able to answer and, and uh, answer any technical questions. All right, so there is one question um, asking about, they, they've noticed, um, basically they asked how many cores this ran on. Um, so we've actually changed uh, how the platform works a little bit. Um, so if you do a traditional CFD on a desktop solution, it's going to use how many cores um, your computer has. Um, maybe you're using a laptop with a quad core, you know, uh, Intel chip, so it ha it's using four cores. Um, now when you're meshing, you actually used to have to, if you've, you've been using the platform for a while, select how many cores um, you want to use, and then same with solve. A lot of new users get kind of tripped up on this. Um, it's not very clear to them, and then um, what, are the, what are the tips and tricks, or what are the uh, hardware requirements? Um, so what we've actually done recently is uh, automate this. So when you go to hit mesh, it's just completely automatic. What we're doing on our end is we're saying, okay, um, you know, 99% of users need this uh, hardware requirement. If that doesn't work, we'll step it up. Um, but the meshing hardware um, requirements are very different than the actual solve ones. So, um, so they're both automatic now. What will happen is it'll generate the mesh, and then um, when you're ready to hit solve, um, when you submit, it's going to look at the size of the mesh and then choose the machine that's best for you. Um, so it's going to solve it as fast as possible. Um, you, we still show that core hour amount and then the total wall clock time and minutes. So you can always calculate on your own uh, what machine was used. All right, looks like we do have a couple questions coming in. Uh, okay, so awesome. So someone asked, uh, how do you consider wall boundary conditions? That's a good point, and I actually kind of glazed over that. So let's just take a look at the model. Um, happy to, to look at the setup here. So um, yeah, we have made a lot of changes on the platform. Um, you know, when, when I started about a year ago, um, when you submit a simulation and you didn't have a boundary condition on every face, it would give you a warning. Um, so now we do just treat them as walls. So, 
I, I did add a boundary condition I, I sort of forgot about. So there, I added an external wall boundary condition. So these are grabbing external faces of the domain um, where there's going to be conduction heat transfer through the chassis. Um, I'm using a convection coefficient here. So first of all, you assign a wall boundary condition. At temperature, instead of fixed, you use an external wall heat flux. Instead of a fixed heat flux, it's going to be a derived heat flux. And then it's going to be a heat transfer coefficient. Um, now, a heat uh, transfer coefficient, I'm using 10 watts uh, per meter per K, uh, uh, per meter square per K, excuse me. Um, what, this saying, what this is saying is um, if at, at a wall interface, um, there's a w one meter square of area, there's a one degree delta across it, there's going to be 10 watts leaving that face. Between the five and 10 watts, uh, even a little higher, uh, tends to be a very good approximation of natural convection. So a lot of times, and, and people won't always be convinced of this, so a lot of times I'll encourage people, um, you know, maybe you'll have this chassis. Um, it, it's better to do in a natural convection application. Um, but um, basically, um, you know, model a huge air volume. Model, you know, your electronics um, levitating in a, in a huge room um, and, and get your thermal performance out of it, chip temperatures. Then, and this is for a closed uh, natural convection application. Next, just um, don't model that external air volume. Just put a um, convection coefficient like this on the outside of your sealed chassis, and you'll probably get the same result. If not, you should modify the heat transfer coefficient a little bit. It's just an approximation. Um, other than this, um, all the other faces in the domain are, are basically considered um, no slip and thermally coupled. So no resistance between the interfaces. Uh, no thermal resistance, and it is a no slip, so you're getting boundary layers and all. All right, so some people are asking about meshing, um, which is great. So I actually um, sort of skipped meshing, but I'm, I'm happy to chat about it. Uh, it's, it's certainly worth touching on. Um, so I, I use the quite a few different meshes here. So I think if you if I look here, um, I did like there's one mesh that's 1.9 million, 3.2, 5, and then 8 million. Um, I'm using the new, I'll just arbitrarily select the first one. I'm using the new standard algorithm. Um, it's automatic sizing and for the fineness, uh, usually when I end up doing, um, is sticking with the, the normal default five fineness. Sometimes I go up to six or seven um, and, and yeah, that's that. Um, now under advanced settings, it's worth noting so that we have a small feature suppression. This basically just um, suppresses very small edges. I usually set it to one micrometer. Um, I don't use gap elements. You can use it. Um, what's, th what this will do is, is force cells in between tiny channels. It could be helpful for um, conjugate heat transfer, but it's going to add a lot of cells into the model. So unless you really need it, I tend to uh, stay away from it. Um, and then the number of processors, this is what I was talking about. It's completely automatic now. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, for this model, I did use uh, boundary layers. I just used the, the default, right? So we're, we're using three layers, overall thickness of 0.4. So that's basically 40% um, of an adjacent um, hex element. And the growth rate is 1.5. So each, uh, starting at the wall, each layer is 150% um, larger than the one before it. Um, what I'll go ahead and just, we can spend some time on meshing. So I'm gonna go ahead and just say, um, let's generate a new mesh. So create new mesh. Now, a few things, especially if you're new to the platform, um, might get you a little confused. So I'm just gonna add that one micrometer feature suppression. So by default, we have automatic boundary layers, and then you always want to leave the hex element core on, so, so don't touch that. Under generate, um, this is actually grayed out, which is a little confusing. Um, what's going on is we're actually um, automating the boundary layer assignment. So the platform is saying, okay, at all the faces or, or interfaces between a fluid and a solid, we need to add wall layers. Um, the problem is until the mesh generates and the solve is submitted, um, we can't guarantee that things won't be changed. So uh, what if you hit generate on the mesh? This is all good, but then you unassigned aluminum and assigned it air. Now that would be wrong, and then you submitted your solution. So for now, it's, it's grayed out um, when you have the automatic boundary layers on. If you go down to simulation run and you click uh, go, and we'll just go ahead and hit start here. 
what this is going to do is it starts commute, uh, computing the mesh. Um, this is automatic and now it can guarantee because you can no longer change the inputs. It's, it's already been queued. So it's going to generate the mesh. Um, and we can, we can leave that for now. If you want to change your mesh or if you want to look at your mesh before you submit it for solve, let's just go ahead and go ahead and say create a new mesh. Um, you just turn off automatic um, boundary layers. So here I'm just going to say okay, um, turn off automatic boundary layers. You can still use them. Um, I'm going to just grab the fluid volume, going to um, invert selection, hide uh, selection, and then I'm just going to add a refinement, add an inflate boundary layer. I'm going to box select everything, and then just deselect the inlet and outlet. And I'm, I just tend to name it boundary layer. Um, so at this point, you can uh, go ahead and, and just um, generate your mesh. Um, so if we go here, uh, the generate is not uh, grayed out. All right, uh, bear with, with me when I take a look at some of these other questions. Spend a minute on um, meshing. I'm not sure by it needs to set boundary layer condition for incompressible analysis. Um, anytime you're doing fluid flow um, simulation, you should use boundary layers, generally speaking. Um, now, do we have any useful boundary conditions for natural convection? That's a, yeah, that's a good question. Um, if I look under boundary conditions, we actually have this natural convection inlet outlet boundary condition. Um, so that is new, and this is a force convection application, but maybe I can try to, uh, we're kind of running low on time, but um, if I were to treat this, um, maybe I can just get rid of the uh, open inner region and then put an enclosure around this. Um, I hope uh, this is not more confusing, but if we did an enclosure, so if this was a natural convection application and we were to start to size this and say, okay, um, let's just uh, make it pretty large. So we'll go ahead and do um, um, something like this. And then we'll grab a face. Um, what you would do is use that new boundary condition on all these external faces. Um, so what it is is it's basically a, a pressure boundary condition where you also define temperature. In the background, it's it's if you know OpenFOAM a little bit, it's an inlet outlet boundary condition. Um, so for instance, on the top face, most of flow is going to actually leave that face. Um, but if it happens to come back in, we'll tag it with 19.85 uh, Celsius and uh, we'll, we'll always have a pressure there. But we'll also, so on the same face, we'll let flow enter and exit. Um, that's, um, that's what that new boundary condition is. And I definitely encourage you to, to test it out for natural convection. Awesome. Um, I think that's it. So thank you very much um, for attending. And um, this will be available um, as a recording and you'll be able to see my, my motto as well. So thank you very much and have a good day.